Spanish explorers in the southeast. Today we shall recount the history of three important Spanish explorers of the southeastern United States. Their names were Ponte de Leon, Panfilo Narvaez, and Hernando de Soto. Each one of these men, in his quest for adventure and wealth, added significantly to the world's knowledge of American geography. The first Spanish explorer of what is now the United States was Ponte de Leon, who came to America at the age of 45 on one of Columbus' expeditions between 1493 and 1502. It finally became obvious to the Spaniards that they had not reached India, but instead had discovered a new continent. After Columbus' death, new leaders and explorers were necessary if Spain was to claim this new continent. Ponte de Leon assumed a position of leadership in the defense and exploration of the New World. In 1508, he led the Spaniards in a battle against the Indians, conquering Puerto Rico. The island was named Puerto Rico, which in Spanish means rich port, because the Spanish were confident that these newly conquered territories would bring much gold and other forms of wealth to their country. Once the savage inhabitants of the islands had been subdued, it was possible for colonists from Spain to come to these lands and settle permanently. Thus the Spaniards spared no effort to defeat the Indians. The conquest completed, the Spanish treated the Indians with ruthless cruelty. They were tortured and questioned about the location of gold and other treasures. If they refused to submit to Spanish rule, they were killed. Those who submitted were put to work as slaves. The Indians had nothing to look forward to but a life of misery and thousands of them died from mistreatment. But Spain had won the island of Puerto Rico, which she added to her possessions. Then an old Indian woman told Ponte de Leon of much gold and a fountain of youth to be found in the north. Perhaps she was only recounting an old tribal legend, or perhaps she thought that the promise of wealth would lure the Spaniards away from her island permanently, so that the old order would return. She talked at great length about the fountain of youth. She said that if a man drank of its waters, he would receive eternal youth. Ponte de Leon tended to doubt her story, but then, who could tell what wonders might be found in the new world? He decided to lead an expedition north to see what could be found. In March 1513, Ponte de Leon, with a fleet of ships, started out in search of the fountain of youth. A Spanish priest gave the expedition his blessing. The voyage of discovery was underway. Day after day they sailed, scanning the horizon for a sign of land. Finally, one morning, a patch of green was sighted. And on Easter Day, 1513, Ponte de Leon discovered the land he called Florida. This name, which means land of flowers, was inspired by the lovely tropical blossoms which the explorer saw growing wild on the shore. Ponte de Leon considered that this new territory would be a rich prize for Spain. The Florida Indians, however, had heard of Spanish cruelty, and they were determined to resist. They sailed out to the ships in their small boats and began to attack the Spaniards. It was true that they had only the crudest of weapons, but then on the other hand, they greatly outnumbered the European invaders. It was all Ponte de Leon could do to hold them off, let alone take control of their territory. Discouraged, Ponte sailed back to the West Indies to get reinforcements. He saw that Florida could only be taken with a large company of armed men. He did his best to convince the royal authorities of the value of conquering this new territory. His proposal was seriously considered, and information was sent to the King of Spain concerning Ponte de Leon's expedition. However, the King ordered him to attack the Caribs to the south. The Caribs were a tribe of Indians inhabiting the islands of the West Indies. It is for them that the Caribbean Sea is named. They refused to submit to Spanish rule, and the king felt it would be wiser to take over completely the lands which had already been explored before seeking to conquer unknown territories. 
Ponte de Leon bowed to the king's will and led a military expedition against the rebellious Indians. This attack was successful, and the Caribs were completely exterminated. The fierceness of the Indians was no match for the superior Spanish weapons. Spanish domination in the West Indies was assured. Now that Ponte de Leon had successfully completed his mission, he was allowed to take up his exploration of Florida once more. Ponte returned to Florida and found the Indians still hostile. He was struck by an arrow in one of the battles with them. This resulted in his death in 1521. He was the first to attempt conquest of the continental United States. He never did, of course, discover the fabled fountain of youth or any gold for that matter. But he did manage to establish a Spanish foothold in Florida by setting up a fort which was to become the city of St. Augustine. The task of exploring the new territory and settling it was now left to others. Panfilo Narvaez, who had been defeated by Cortes in Mexico, was among those who dreamed of a rich empire to the north. He returned to Spain to obtain money, supplies, and men in order to set up a colonizing expedition to Florida. Narvaez sailed from Spain in 1527 with 600 colonists and many Franciscan monks. It was his intention to establish a fort and a small village on the coast of Florida which could be used as a base for military operations and exploration. He was also certain that treasure could be found in this new territory. Landing on the Florida coast in 1528, Narvaez and his men found unloading the expedition rough and tiresome work. Actually, Narvaez had little interest in the colonization of the territory. He was anxious to begin the search for treasure. He began organizing scouting parties to see what could be found in the surrounding country. Narayath discovered a gold trinket in an Indian hut nearby. He was sure that vast treasure was close at hand. However, no gold could be located in the area. Narayath began to interrogate the Indians as to where gold could be found. Actually, they knew no more about the location of gold mines than Narayath himself but they saw that such an answer would not be acceptable to the Spaniards. The Indians told Navayeth that the wealthy city of Appalachian was to the north. He plunged into the Florida jungles. The going was not easy. The Spaniards had swamps, mosquitoes, and the tropical heat to contend with. After weeks of hacking their way through the thick forest, the expedition arrived at Appalachian. But no gold was found. Wealthy Appalachian was only a tiny Indian village. These Indians had no more gold than the others. The whole expedition had been made in vain. Disappointed, Narvaez returned to the coast to find that his ships had sailed back to Cuba. The other Spaniards thought he was dead. They saw no reason to remain in this wild, unexplored territory with its hostile inhabitants. Narvaez and his men would have to shift for themselves. The desperate Spaniards were reduced by starvation to eating their horses. They built small boats and sailed away from the Bay of Horses, which is the name they gave to this point of the Florida coast. Their only hope was to construct small boats which might take them safely back to lands already settled by the Spaniards. They thought Mexico was close by and launched their tiny craft. They imagined that they could survive long enough to reach Mexico where they would be well received by the Spanish colonists. With some degree of confidence, they set out on their journey. Sailing along the northern shores of the Gulf of Mexico, they reached Texas when a terrific storm hit. And in November 1528, Narvaez perished, his boat blown out to sea. If it had not been for the other survivors, Narvaez's fate would have remained forever unknown. But some of his men did manage to reach Spanish territory to recount their terrible adventure. The New World had claimed the life of another explorer. After the death of Narvaez, Hernando de Soto was commissioned by the king to explore Florida further. He and his wife were overjoyed when he received this commission. They were sure their fortune was made. De Soto began making preparations for the expedition. So great was the enthusiasm of all classes to go with him that de Soto had to refuse many. Dukes and grandees who needed money sought to accompany de Soto in order to grab some of the gold which they were sure was to be found in the New World. 
De Soto, however, only accepted those who he thought would make a valuable contribution to the expedition. In 1538, he sailed with his wife, 600 men, and priests. The departure of his ships was a festive occasion. Everyone was certain that the ships would return laden with gold and silver. They arrived at Cuba in the fall of that year. In Cuba, they passed a gay winter attending many parties. De Soto and his wife were much sought out by the established colonists who were eager for news of Spain and the court. Although De Soto found Cuban social life entertaining, he was anxious to begin the real business of the expedition. And in the spring, De Soto set out for Florida with 570 men and 223 horses. His wife waved goodbye to him sadly. She knew the dangers of the voyage and wondered if she would ever see her husband again. Twelve days later, they landed at Tampa Bay. The alarmed Indians spread the word of the Spaniards coming, but their defense was only half-hearted. What could they do against the death-dealing Spanish muskets? Most of the villages surrendered without a struggle. De Soto discovered small fire-blackened pearls in an Indian village. He took this to mean that a source of treasure was nearby. His desire for wealth made him eager to push onward in his exploration of these unknown lands. He started for the interior with his men, horses, and dogs, but progress was very slow because no roads as yet existed in these untouched forests. Besides, there was the ever-present threat of attack from the Indians. A battle was started when the Indians tried to rescue a chief captured by the Spaniards. De Soto was finally victorious, but a number of his best men were lost. The first note of discouragement made itself felt among the ranks of the Spaniards. Following along in the same direction which Narvaez had taken ten years before, De Soto and his men finally reached the village of Appalachian. They camped at Appalachian for the winter, where the men had to eat Indian food. All of their food supplies, which they had brought from Cuba, were exhausted. The simple Indian fare was disagreeable to them, but it was the only thing that stood between them and starvation. The following spring in Georgia, De Soto met a female Indian chief who gave him pearls. She thought that this would satisfy his craving for wealth, so that her tribe would be spared a war. He took the pearls, then ordered her arrested, he was certain that she must know the location of much greater treasures and planned to hold her in captivity until she gave him the information he wanted. But the woman outwitted him and escaped, taking the pearls with her. She had not been guarded closely enough. She and her attendants stole away one night while the Spaniards were sleeping. Another failure was chalked up to De Soto's expedition, but the leader refused to give up. Too much was at stake. De Soto's army moved westward to what is now Mobile, Alabama. At that time, however, it was only a simple Indian village made up of a few thatched huts. Glancing about, De Soto and his men knew better than to expect to find great treasure, but something forced them to seek it out anyway. They were attacked by the Indians and driven from the town. They had never expected to encounter so much resistance from such an insignificant village as this one. Their lack of preparation for battle had been their undoing, but they decided not to give up so easily. De Soto's men counterattacked, burning the town and massacring the Indians. Quite predictably, they found no gold among the ruins. Besides the heavy loss of men, the rest of the pearls and most of the baggage was burned. De Soto sat and pondered all of the failures with which his expedition had been afflicted. He really saw little point in continuing the journey. The new world seemed completely empty of gold or silver. De Soto still ordered the army westward, determined to find real treasure. Somehow, as long as his men could march, he felt that they must go on. The city of gold might be close at hand. Besides, the king would be furious if his investment in the expedition came to naught. As De Soto moved westward, he suddenly stumbled upon a major discovery, but it was not gold. He discovered the Mississippi River in 1541 at Chickasaw Bluffs. De Soto admired this vast waterway, and he saw in it a solution to one of his problems. Travel by water was much speedier than travel by land. 
he would navigate the river and find treasure somewhere along its banks. After building small rafts, DeSoto and his men crossed the Mississippi and plunged into Arkansas. The explorer came upon forests, Indians, and wild animals. But no gold. He neared the edge of the plains at the same time that Coronado advanced from the west. This second Spanish explorer had begun his expedition from Mexico, moving northward through Texas in search of the legendary golden city of El Dorado. Coronado was to meet with no more success than De Soto. De Soto's optimism was growing weaker, but on the other hand, he knew that travel on the Great Plains would not be difficult. He did not reckon with the severe blizzards which struck these lands during the winter. The Spaniards and their Indian slaves endured three months of bitter weather. The tiny shelters which they built offered little protection from the icy winter winds. Disease began to strike down the Spaniards. And in May, De Soto died alone in a hut, blamed by his men for their troubles. None of his dreams had come true. The Spaniards buried De Soto in the great river which he had discovered, the Mississippi, to keep from the Indians the news that he was not immortal. The Indians had feared De Soto as a god, and if they learned of his death, nothing would keep them from attacking the Spaniards. After De Soto's death, the soldiers decided unanimously to turn back. With De Soto's Lieutenant Masosco in command, they built small boats and tried again to reach Mexico. The Indians were happy to see them leave, but not so happy as the Spaniards were themselves to leave. After a bitter voyage of great hardship, they reached a Mexican coastal town. They could hardly believe that they had returned safely to their own people. The expedition had been a failure from the standpoint of finding gold, but the survivors were able to turn over a great deal of information about the North American continent, which was useful in later explorations. De Soto's contribution has been summed up as follows. De Soto's explorations of the southern United States and his discovery of the Mississippi River assure him a place of importance in American history. And in the long run, perhaps the expanded knowledge of American geography came to be worth more than any gold De Soto might have found.